how I was so desperate to be happy that one day I typed in how to be happy into YouTube search. And I found a bunch of naked gurus who are gurus that teach lots of personal development and self-help things, but no actionable steps. They don't teach you how to do the things. But that's okay, because that led me to Jay, who taught me five awesome life hacks so that I could be happy. And today, we're going to tell you what those five life hacks are, but one is going to feel like a hit crime. Dun, dun, dun. The first life hack to help you be happy is to spin your thoughts. Now, when I heard this the first time, I hated it. I thought it was really stupid because I'm all about my feelings and in my feelings and talk about my feelings and feel my feelings. So to me, I thought, what in the hell do my thoughts have anything to do with my happiness? So Jay, can you explain this, please? Sure. Let me ask you a question. Are thoughts and feelings connected? Yes, they are. Okay. So does that mean thoughts can influence and affect feelings and feelings can influence and affect thoughts? Yes. Right. So clearly your feeling of happiness relies heavily on the thoughts that you think. Yeah, I guess. I mean, yes. You said they were related. Yeah. Yes, they are. Okay. All right. Okay. And since you were little, what do you have more practice controlling? Your thoughts, your conscious mind, or whatever your feelings happen to be? That's a great question. Uh, well, I could control my thoughts easier. Yeah. Do you know anyone who has more practice controlling whatever's going on with their feelings than they do with their conscious thoughts? No. Right. We're all thinking a million things a day. We get to think about yeah. breakfast. We think about lunch. We think about going down the street. We think about crossing the street when we don't like that path. We think about the neighbor that we judge. We think about our failures in business. We think about everything, right? Right. We're choosing thoughts all the time. Yes. Everyone is practiced at controlling their thoughts and thinking the things that they want to think. Some are better and some are worse, but you won't find someone who is better at controlling their feelings than they are their thoughts. Yeah, true. Right. So they're both related. They both contribute to our happiness, but one of them we're super practiced at. One of them we have a very good handle on. Right. Yes. Yeah. The other one is like a write-off. Most people don't even think they can control their feelings at all. Yeah, that's true. Okay. Yeah. So what do you have more practice controlling, your thoughts or your feelings? Oh, uh, my thoughts. Exactly. And so out of these two things, if you want to reach happiness, what's going to be your strongest avenue of attack? Like what's going to get you to happiness fastest? The thing you've never practiced at all or the thing you're super good at and have been doing since you were little? The thing that I've been, I'm good at and have been doing since I was little. Right. So anyone who thinks, oh, thoughts are BS, there's no point in controlling them. I, I am a feelings person. I care about that. I mean, they're still hyper practiced at controlling their thoughts in comparison to controlling their feelings. Well, yeah, because most people would say they can't control their feelings. Right. I, I thought that for a long time, yeah. too. That's why this is hack number one. We're all very practiced at controlling our thoughts. Even if some people are better and some people are worse and it's a struggle for you or whatever, mm -hmm. it's a complete write-off trying to control your feelings. Like for most people, your best starting point is still starting with controlling your thoughts. It's what you've got practice at. So this was one of the first things that you had me practice when we first met was to to control my thoughts everyone practices it all the time and and so yes you're correct because we all do if some if we don't want to think about something we immediately stop like you think about something else and this will change how we feel and also we'll, and we have complete control but how can that make me happier i'm not going to think about gossiping about my neighbor but does that really matter Okay, so we'll get there. Okay, but I just okay. want to address what okay. you said in the beginning, which is I'm all about my feelings and I didn't think <laughs> thoughts matter. All right. It's like you seriously want to argue that thoughts don't matter and you're going to have an easier time controlling your feelings. Fair play. Okay. So then who's happier in life? Someone who thinks a bunch of positive things or someone who thinks a bunch of negative things? Probably the person who thinks. Well, not probably. Can you find me anyone who thinks a bunch of negative things and is just a happy person? No. No, if you're a negative person you're an unhappy inside. That that was me before we met. I was super negative about everything and everyone. Sure, because thoughts influence feelings. Okay. Right. So negative thoughts will lead to <clears throat> negative feelings. And positive thoughts will lead to positive feelings. Yeah. 
Not that I even believe in negative and positive, but that's a whole other podcast. Yes. The point for now, for the teaching, for the lesson, for the message, is that basically negative thoughts will lead to negative feelings. And if you examine any human being, you will see this holds up. Fair enough. Okay. Do you know any negative people in your life who think negative thoughts? Yes. Are they happy? No. Right. Do you know any positive people who think positive thoughts? Yes. Are they happy? Yes. So. Okay. Fair enough. Okay. So now we understand that thoughts heavily influence our feelings. Mm -hmm. We understand that pretty much everyone is more practiced at controlling their thoughts than they are their feelings. Mm -hmm. And we understand there are basically two types of thinking you can have negative thoughts and positive thoughts. And the people who spend their time thinking a lot of negative thoughts will end up unhappy very quickly. And the people who spend a lot of time thinking positive thoughts are guaranteed to get that happiness result. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And do you know the statistic about how many thoughts people have a day on average? It's a bunch. It's a couple thousand, hundred thousand or something. Yeah. I think it's 50 to 60,000 or 55,000 thoughts a day. Right. Okay. Okay. So you're going to have 55,000 thoughts today and you're going to have 55,000 thoughts tomorrow and you're going to have 55,000 thoughts the next day. And so are all of our viewers on average. Some will have a few less, some will have a few more, whatever. And some of those thoughts are going to be helpful and valuable and of service. And some of those thoughts are going to be harmful and painful and move you away from happiness. Okay. And who controls those 55,000 thoughts you're going to have today and tomorrow and the next day? Do I? Does the media control your thoughts? No. Does mean next door neighbors or? No, nobody else controls our thoughts but us. But a lot of people want to blame other people for their thoughts. But no one is actually doing any mind control thingy to us. So I control my own thoughts. You control yours and they control theirs. Yeah. Are there people on the planet who used to be negative and anxious and depressed and hateful and so on? And they made the journey to a positive balance of thoughts? Yeah, that was me. <laughs> yeah, me too. When I was homeless, I was pretty miserable. Now I'm a pretty positive dude. Yeah, that's true. Did someone magically control our thoughts for us? Or did we just practice, do the work and shift our thoughts? No, we practiced, we did the work and shifted, shifted our thoughts. Right. And did we do it one by one? Yes. Yeah, sometimes. So that's it, right? You want to go from sad to happy or negative to positive. Practice controlling your thoughts. I'm not saying it's easy, but it is simple. It's a very simple, clear path. Everyone takes the same path. Everyone has the same 55,000 thoughts. Everyone has to go from negative to positive. Everyone has to tweak their thoughts and catch them and practice new ones and start seeing things differently and thinking differently. And eventually they'll get a happy result because thoughts affect feelings. That's true. Does it ever happen any other way? No. Even people who just take a bunch of meds and end up happy. Mm -hmm. Was it the meds that made them happy? No. Or did they start thinking, thinking different things? Yeah. They, and they this started, is helping me. Yes. I'm on my way. This is good. I'm yes. getting better. I'm healing. Right? Yes. yes. Because you can give people placebo medication, fake medication, yes. and the same thing will still happen. And there are some people who don't believe in medication and they, they secretly doubt it and they're taking it and it's never working. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's your thoughts that lead to the happiness. It's true. Yeah. yeah. It's the same for everyone. You show me anyone and they will have taken the same journey. They would have started from a whole bunch of negative thoughts like me when I was homeless or you when you were a junkie and they would eventually start believing in themselves and thinking better things and I'm getting the hang of this and so on and so forth. And soon their balance of thoughts throughout the day will be mostly positive. Out of 55,000, they'll have, you know, 30,000 that are positive. It's like, okay, they made it. Yeah. It used to be 1,000 that were positive and they were all negative. Now they made it to 30,000 that are positive. Yeah. So when I was a uh, really negative and when I was an unhappy person, one of the things I would do when I first started trying to control my thoughts and, and switch my thoughts was asking myself, what's the opposite of this feeling? Mm -hmm. So because I was a super negative person and I would, I judged everything and whatever. And when I had this thought, I would just, especially when it was came to judging, because that was like the first thing that I was caught often was how I judged everything, not just people, but like I'd go out in the hallways. Why do they choose this ugly green color? This is so ugly. I would never choose that. And look, this is wrong. And this is wrong. And this is in the hallway. And now there's no one there. Like, <laughs> it's just. Being super judgmental. And then it was, what can I see that I like 
about the hallway. Well, there's a big mirror at the end and I can pretend that I'm on a catwalk. And I used to always look at myself in the mirror when I walked down the hallway. And then I would say, well, this green is much better than like caca brown or something. So it's better. <laughs> and, I, and the elevator is always fast and there's a garbage chute here. And they're like, it sounds dumb. And these are little things, but those were the first steps I started to take to be more positive. And I'm not perfect at it. Yesterday I had a, I had a few moments where I was thinking negative things, but now I use those as a way to remind myself that I'm a positive person and I still do the flip. What can I find that's what's the opposite of this? So yeah, that's a great start. Fantastic practical steps. I mean, what's a more positive thought? Judging people or live and let live and okay, fine. It's not my choice or what I prefer, but they're on their own journey. Like maybe they haven't learned that yet or they don't have a great color taste yet or whatever. We have different tastes. Yeah. Much better. Well done. And that's spinning thoughts. That's the whole thing of spinning thoughts because when a, when a thought comes at you or when you, you get a thought or when you think a thought, it starts out as neutral. Mm -hmm. So So when you have a thought, the thought will be about a certain topic or category. Your thought will be about money. Your thought will be about relationships. Your thought will be about fashion choice. Your, your thought will be about the environment or whatever. Mm -hmm. And those topics are all neutral. Money is a neutral topic. Relationships a neutral topic. Health's a neutral topic. The environment's a neutral topic. Like they're just, they just exist. Right. And so as soon as the topic surfaces in your brain, or as soon as you start engaging with the topic, like when you walk out into the hall, you make the topic go from neutral to positive or from neutral to negative. You either think, I'm so blessed we even have this hall. I'm so glad somebody made it and the construction workers paved it and the architect designed it and so on. Or you walk out and make the topic negative. I hate this hallway. I hate seeing this ugly green color. It makes me nauseous. Whoever chose it is stupid. Like... <laughs> Yeah, it's basically. Yeah. And and so you can walk in, into the hall, the neutral topic of the hall and think a whole bunch of negative things that will hurt your happiness of the day right. and your your happiness habit. And then your child could come out right behind you and be playing and laughing. Like, I love the space. I love the freedom and not care at all about the green. Right. Yeah. That's the choice. Yeah, true. Every thought starts out as neutral, but we make it more and more one way or the other. And soon... If you have a habit of making things negative, you'll make every topic negative. Yes. And when you get to that point, then it feels impossible. How could I ever control my thoughts? How could I ever change my thoughts? They just think for themselves. My brain has a mind of its own. It's like, all right, man, if you want to believe that, I can't change it. You get to believe whatever you want to believe and that will become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. I know that every human being that's ever born controls their own thoughts. They have since they were a toddler. They're still doing it now, even if it seems like they're not and they're rusty and out of practice. But I'm not going to try and talk somebody out of it. If you want to believe you're at the mercy of your thoughts, you're a victim for life, you go ahead and believe that. Right. But once you start doing research and looking into it and studying, you will notice that all 8 billion humans control their own thoughts. It's an inalienable, untouchable power. We're all born with thoughts the power right yeah and if you're like me when i was in my dark homeless years you're gonna be thinking a lot of negative thoughts and you have a long journey ahead of you yeah. it wasn't super easy for me to magically become positive while i'm sleeping on an icy cold park stuffing a bunch of newspapers under me and sleeping on my backpack like arched over my backpack trying to avoid the cold ground and shit who's thinking positive thoughts then yeah no one yeah but that's the practice. That's the work. That's hack number one. Get good at controlling your thoughts and make them positive. Well, at least I'm not dead, you know? Yeah. At least I have another chance tomorrow to get out of the snow. At least I can hunt for shelter again tomorrow. At least I learned that this park is not the best place for me and I'm going to go somewhere else next time. At least, at least, at least. Look for the silver lining. Find the positive. If you can't find the positive in that topic, ignore that topic. And at least I can take a deep breath today. Ah, oh, that feels so good. At least I have my phone for YouTube or something. Whatever the case, your job with this hack is to practice thinking more positive things. I don't care how hard it is. I don't care how far a journey it is. I don't care if you think there's an easier way or whatever. This is it. This is the number one hack for anyone because we're all good thinkers. We all have our racing minds. We've all been thinking since we were little and we thought about a million things and a million different topics. 
And if they've got negative, it's time to start thinking positive and it won't change you overnight. It takes actual work and actual effort and actual applying things. And no one will ever invent a magic pill that makes all your thoughts positive. Never going to happen. Right. Yeah. One, one doesn't exist now and one's not going to exist in the future. True. This is part of the game of life. The game of life is to grow and blossom and become more mature and more zen and figure your shit out. It's to become more positive and more optimistic. And if you start off in a pessimistic place, fine, you still got to make the journey. But there ain't no magic pill that's going to undo all of life and make it easy for you. Yeah. So... It's true. And I know there's a lot of people who have a lot of pain and they've gone through a lot of abuse and trauma because I, I have two in my past. And I, I know sometimes it's easy to blame those things. Well, I can't be happy because of, of all that trauma. And I understand. Well, that's but, the first thought you got to change. But um, yeah, I was going to say that. <laughs> like you have to change that to somehow find the positive, whether it's because Whatever it was, it made you who you are today. It made you strong, stronger, smarter, braver, like something. There's a there's something positive that can't comes out of everything that happens to you, good or bad. And you know, when I first heard this idea of spinning the thought, like, and you said like it was neutral, because you, you made a meme for this. Thoughts are neutral. I was like, hell no, they're not. As soon as I like think them, that's a negative or whatever it is. And like, especially when it came to like my past traumas and things like that's no abuse. Ew, that's that's a negative thing. But it's actually a neutral topic. The idea, the topic, I'm not saying the act, but the, the topic as a whole, it doesn't it doesn't come into your brain with spikes and knives and guns and, and it's trying to kill you or hurt you. Well, are there some people who suffered abuse and became stronger through it and became an inspirational speaker, a yes. motivational speaker, and now they started a foundation and now they help everyone and they never would have done any of that without the abuse? Yes. Yes. So for some people, they've spun the topic into a positive for themselves. Yeah. The exact same thing happened to other people, but they spun it into something positive. Yeah. This is it. Like, you can spin anything into a positive. You can also spin anything into a negative. I could give a list of all the best things in the world and they'd be like, he did that for his selfish reasons. That wasn't charity. And they did that because they're mean. And they did that because they just seek profit. And they did that for this reason. And it's all manipulation. And this is an agenda. And they're, it's all a giant conspiracy. And we're being played. And it's like, okay, well, I'm sorry I said people did nice stuff. <laughs> But at the same time, I can give you a whole list of negative things like abuse and murder. You were a drug addict. I was homeless, blah, 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 blah. And I can sing its praises and be like, this yeah. is a positive thing. Clearly, clearly thoughts are neutral and you can spin them whichever way you want. Yes. Every every thought, whether no matter how negative and terrible it, it feels in your head, you can always turn it into a positive thing. There's always ways. And there's someone else out there doing that very thing and they're winning from it. So you get to choose. Do you want to be the whiny victim who never changes their thoughts and just calls everything negative and labels it and is pessimistic? Or do you want to be the dude who ch turns his life around and takes that exact same negative, negative thing, sees it as a positive, builds off of it, becomes stronger through it, creates an empire off of it and crushes life? That's it. You get two choices. You can be person A or person B. Yeah. And it all starts with how you spend your thoughts. Yeah, exactly. Well, <laughs> I'm still learning how to do this better and, and I still have a lot of practice. Me too. And the other day I, I was talking to somebody that I fairly recently met and I said, I'm super positive and kind of annoyingly cheerful. But I had a laugh later when I thought about it because I used to be the opposite. People would say like, oh, me too. she's mean and rude and I'm like, it's okay. And, and I was so hateful. But now I've gone the opposite way. But I still have work to go because the other day, I don't remember what I said. I was like, I sucked my teeth about something. I was just like, and you like spin it positive immediately. I wasn't even like negative thoughts too bad. It was just like, oh, that sucks. And you were like, no, that's positive. That's great. <laughs> and I said, like, God, you're so annoying positive. But I like it because I need and want that positivity in my life. So even if you think that those thoughts are coming in negative, you're making them negative. Probably out of habit. Yeah. And it's out of habit. And I know I'm taking responsibility for that. Like in the beginning for me, it was like, no, that's not true, but it is. And it's okay. And admitting it means that's the first step to changing it to positive. So 
Yeah, last episode, I think one of the points was the more responsibility you take for things, the more control you have over them. If you take responsibility for what your arm does, you get control over your arm. If you say you have no responsibility for your arm, doesn't it just does whatever it wants, then you have no control of your arm. Yeah. Same with your thoughts. Yeah, it's true. If you take responsibility for them, you get to control them. Right. You get to work on them. You get to polish them. You get to, okay, okay, fine. I thought that out of habit, but I'm going to catch myself next time. If you take no responsibility for them, oh, they control me and I'm just a victim, then you have no control. You'll never control your thoughts and you'll be stuck negative forever, like until you change it. Yeah. So because I'm a woman, I thought that my, I thought (laughs) my feelings were what ruled me and what mattered and my thoughts were second, but you just showed me that's not true. So that's a perfect segue to go into hack number two, which is mood management. And this one I thought was even more (laughs) BS because I thought I couldn't control my feelings. I thought my feelings tame and and I had zero control over them, but I was wrong. So, Jay, can you please explain hack number two? My pleasure. Do you believe animals have feelings? Do they feel things? Yes. Yeah. They feel hot. They feel cold. They feel hungry. They feel thirsty. They feel that that mailman's not good, but that mailman's nice and extra good. Yes. Okay. And would you say animals are good or not good at controlling their feelings? I think they're good at that. I think that you don't think they're like you. You just said, "Oh, I don't control my feelings." They come and go. They're animals. They're not humans. They don't have the same kind of thoughts as us. So, but do they control their feelings or not? And if they do control them, are they good or bad at it? I think they're good at controlling their emotions. So animals can control their feelings. I think so. Yes. Why? Well, if a cat is annoyed with you and you're petting it, it just runs away. And then it goes somewhere where it feels better and licks itself or finds a comfy pillow and chills. Then it goes like, gets all comfy and, and, and happy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if a dog doesn't like its food, it goes away. Like from the bowl or whatever, it just turns its nose and goes laid down or plays with something or finds a way to be happier. Yeah. So it sounds like... Animals pay attention to their feelings and instantly change something if they're feeling uncomfortable or unoptimal or not ideal. Yeah. I know where you're going now with this. Well, are humans and animals? I didn't think of that before. Yes, the animals are humans. <laughs> yes, humans are animals. Right. And so we have feelings as well. Yes. And like the animals, once we have a feeling, we have an opportunity to change it. Yeah. And the animals always take the opportunity to change it. Yeah. They never sit on the opportunity. They don't delay the opportunity. They don't wait on the opportunity. They don't piss off the opportunity. They they pounce on the opportunity. I feel bad. I'm changing it to feel good. Yeah. A cat's not going to let you pet it if it makes it uncomfortable or annoying. It's not going to and let you continue to pet it. Yeah. And even if you tie it down and stuff, it's still going to find a way to feel better. You can tie it down, but then it'll start wagging its tail like crazy. Why is it doing that? To get rid of the excess energy or to try and struggle out or whatever. Mm -hmm. The animal has a feeling, pays attention to it, and immediately acts on it to feel better. Do humans have the exact same process, the exact same opportunity, the exact same function? Yes. So when you have a feeling, yes, you feel it, and then you, you have an opportunity or a chance to adjust and improve that feeling. If you're cold, you can whine about it or you can put on another layer. You can go to shelter. You can breathe into your hands. You you can do something to change the feeling. If you're giving a presentation and you feel stage fright, you can stop the presentation. You can take a glass of water. You can walk around the stage. You can tell people you're not ready. I'm not prepared. And all of a sudden, the stress will go away. Like, you know what? Uh, This isn't for me. I shouldn't be in Toastmasters. Have fun, everyone. Do you feel crunchy after that? Do you feel bad after that? Are you like, ah... The stage fright is gone and I made a choice for myself and I feel good. All right. Fair enough. Just like the animals. So I don't know who's teaching people that they don't control their feelings or maybe we don't control them, but we have all the power to shift them at any time. We might not control the feeling that arrives, but we definitely get to control the very next feeling. Okay. The very next feeling that arrives. This is good. I'm glad you clarified that because... There's many times I can't control the feeling that hits me when it hits. Same with the animals. They don't control who pets them or who kicks them or who steals their food or whatever, but they control exactly how they feel the next second though. Yes. Yeah. So it's that 
next second. So if, if I get a feeling that feels bad or annoying or whatever, I can choose to think more positive and, and spin that. And well, now that, we're talking about thought control. But, but that makes my feelings feel better. It does. That's one way of changing your feelings. Animals don't have that because they don't think the same way. Right. Yeah. But they find a way, though. Yeah, they find a way to feel better in the very next second. Yes. Oh, I don't like this food. I'm walking away. Oh, yeah. it's cold over here. I'm going to go to the windowsill. Whatever. Yeah. They find a way to feel better. You have extra tools because you can feel better just with switching your thoughts. Yeah. But even if you don't use thought control, you can still do what the animals do. Yeah. Just instinctively do something to feel better. Mm -hmm. But most people repress their instincts, repress their impulses, don't listen to their feelings, don't pay attention to their feelings, don't act on their feelings, and then they suffer for longer and longer and longer. And it's like, well, the animals are better than you. They would never do this. They would automatically find a way to feel better. Even if they were had all the worst challenges in the world and it, people were holding them down and tying them up and not letting them do anything, they would find a way to feel better. So don't give me any excuses. Like You could put the animal under a million different restrictions and they'll still try to find a way to feel better. You're 100% right. Even if I wake up and I don't feel great like emotionally and I'm feeling sad or whatever, if I do yoga or I watch a funny video or I start working. Take a shower. Um, let the yeah, water ca like, cascade down. Oh, any of those things usually will shift my mood. Even if it doesn't shift it to like super happy and wonderful and woo -woo, it does shift it so I don't want to punch holes in the wall. Yeah, and you can keep shifting it from that point. It's yeah. like, okay, I made it feel a little better. Like the dog first turns its nose up at the food and that feels a little better. It's sending a message. Mm -hmm. Then the dog walks away and that feels even more better because I'm not near this substandard food. Then the dog is like, I'm still not happy enough. So I'm going to go outside and find a bone or a stick to mm -hmm. gnaw on. And they go find the bone or the stick to gnaw on. And now they're actually happy. The yeah. dog is happy just by controlling one feeling and controlling the next feeling and controlling the next feeling and controlling the next feeling until they're miles away from like, oh, my master hates me and doesn't give me food. Now they're like, I'm super happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's you can true. always control the next feeling. That's the thing. You can always... You can control how you react to the feeling. Yeah, yeah and you, right? you apply yourself to whatever happens. Life throws you a curveball. You get some kind of yucky feeling. That person was mean to me. This job didn't pan out, whatever. Fine, great, that's life. We all get curveballs. Ain't no one immune to this. I got some yesterday. You got some the day before. They got some afterwards. Whatever. We all get shitty things that happen and our feelings drop. Mm -hmm. But but the people who s succeed in life and who are happy often and all the time are the ones who make the emotional journey to somewhere better. They listen to their feelings. They pay attention to their feelings and they instantly act on it like the animals. And if you think back to when you're an infant or a toddler, you did exactly this, just like the animals. And that's how you grew so fast. You knew if you fell while you were walking, you could like cry about it all day long. Like an adult would do this. Oh, my job didn't pan out. I'm going to be miserable for five weeks. Well, when you were an infant, you were like, oh, my walking didn't pan out. And technically I could be miserable for five weeks, but I'm, I'm smart and I know how to control my feelings and I'm just like the animals and I'm not going to be miserable for five weeks. I'm going to be miserable for five minutes. No, for five seconds. I'm going to cry for five seconds of crying and then I'm going to be back on it. Yeah. 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 As a toddler, you knew how to feel better. Yeah. Mom and dad are yelling. I don't like this environment. You would go hide under the basement stairs or go like curl up in a closet with blankets or go in your bedroom or whatever. Anything to feel better. You didn't even need thought. They didn't need thoughts. Like they didn't have to think, oh, I'm going to spin this into a positive. I think it's good that they're fighting because they're talking it. Like there was no thought yeah. control needed. You just do what the animals do. I have a bad feeling. I'm not going to ignore it. I'm not going to repress it. I'm not going to hate on it. I'm not going to rage against my feelings. How dare I have these bad emotions? I'm just going to be like, okay, this is a super shitty emotion. Let me fix it. Let me do something to feel better. And then you keep doing things to feel better until you're in a very good place, just like the dog did. Yeah. That's good, actually. Uh, actually, and I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up. Are you just use that example if we don't sometimes we don't even have to think we just do whatever we feel like doing in the moment that hits us like if i'm sad because i miss my kids then well i there's a lot of things i could do to feel better do i i could text them i can call them i can go get some work done and but following that feeling that first thought of 
whatever thought it is, usually 99% of the time makes me feel better from whatever, whatever it is. Well, except for some people, like the early version of you, your first thought is repress this and hide this. Yeah, that's a good point. And so then people, <laughs> people have a habit of repressing and hiding their feelings and mm-hmm. sitting on them and shoving them down. And they're like, well, I did the first thing I thought of. Yeah. The first thing I thought to do was just zip my lips and not pretend see, everything's yeah. okay. It's like a dog would never zip their lips and pretend everything's okay. <laughs> no. A cat would never zip their lips and pretend everything's okay. They would speak up. They would express themselves. They would go do something. But everyone's so scared of doing things. No, I can't walk off the stage. That will upset people. No, I can't say I need more space. That would accept people. I can't say, oh, please, I need to go get a hot drink or whatever because I'm cold. That would upset people. And they just yeah. people please, people please and sit on their feelings. And then they wonder why their emotions are all fucked up. And it's like, look, man, you're not going to get anywhere in life doing this. As a toddler, you knew this. The animals know this. I know this. Everyone knows this. Happy people know this. You listen to your feelings and you follow their impulses. You do something to fix them and change them and improve them. You step your way up the emotional ladder, not just deal with them and, oh, they have to exist and I guess this is how life has to be and I'm just going to hold it down and hold it back and until I'm miserable and anxiety ridden and depressed like it's like whatever man that's a, a terrible path for you like you will never get anything great in life going down that path of repression and suppression and hiding and crushing your feelings down yeah agreed so there are a lot of people who think well this is just how I am this is how I feel. They don't think that they can change it in any way. Sure. And just like the first hack, if someone wants to believe I'm at the mercy of my thoughts, no one on earth is changing that. You're not. It's not reality. You're delusional. It's not true at all. It will never be true. All 8 billion humans have control over their own thoughts. But if you want to believe that, I can't change it. Similarly here, when that person was an infant, they had control over their feelings, or at least they were able to take in a feeling and immediately make it better and better and better. They could walk up the emotional ladder for all things. When they fell and cried from walking, they could do it. When they mispronounced something and got frustrated, they could do it. They could. But if they're saying now and claiming now that this is just how I am and my emotions control themselves and I have no agency or power or control or responsibility and I'm just a giant victim of my emotions. That's a belief. You can have that belief. Cling to it for as long as you want. Hang on to it for as long as you want. I don't know if you should bother watching the rest of this episode though. Yeah. How's anyone going to help someone who can't use basic human emotions like the things that animals and toddlers have who, who refuses to use this this powerful blessing, this superpower that we all have. Same for people who refuse to use thought control and they won't put in any, any effort at all. They want a magic pill. They want to point fingers. They want to blame somewhere else. And I have no power. I have no control. I can't do the things you're telling me. Well, I can't is like what what three-year-olds say when they don't want to go to school or whatever. (laughs) Like it's not, this is ridiculous. Okay. So what about Rise Nation? They're ready to to like do the work and do the stuff, but they're not really sure how to to do that. Yeah. So you practice doing what the animals do. You practice paying attention to your feelings. And then shortening the distance or the gap between when you act to fix them. So a lot of us, we have a chat with our boss and it's uncomfortable and we feel disrespected and they didn't promote us or they didn't give us respect or whatever. And then we we don't do anything about it. We don't change a single thing in our life. We go home, we go to work, we complain about it to a spouse or something, and then we haven't changed anything. Right. And we do that for weeks or months or years. That's not fast control of your feelings. That's not a fast improvement of your feelings. A dog would have been like, the boss said something mean, I'm out. (laughs) Yeah. Right. My master said something mean, tail between my legs, I'm gone. Might even run away from home. Right. Fixed. And so that's ideal where you're in tune with your feelings and you're constantly on top of them. You're expressing them. You're making yourself feel better in the moment, super fast, just like the animals. And if we're really far from the ideal, like we put up with abuse for years from our spouse or our boss or whoever, and we don't change our conditions and we don't fix things and don't improve things and find a way to elevate our feelings or our moods, then you're speeding towards sadness and depression and anxiety and all this stuff. So the practice is to get the gap smaller. Okay. Like instead of sitting on it for years, sit on it for 30 days. If I don't find a new job in 30 days, I'm just quitting or I'm going to look for the next 60 days and take whatever I can, even if it's less money. Like. Mm-hmm. As long as you do something to improve your feelings, whatever it happens to be, 
or maybe you put up with it. And I don't want to advise anything untoward or uncool or illegal, but some people just steal from their company. Like they just embezzle or they take pens home or whatever, and it helps them feel better. And I don't want to encourage that, but at least those people are a little bit ahead. They're like kind of have an understanding of how to feel better when their feelings are off kilter, right? right. There's a much healthier way for them to do that. And that is highly recommended. <laughs> But you can see that those people are going to feel a little better inside about themselves than the people who are just putting up with it like doormats. True, true. But the people who feel the best are the ones who find another job or just quit on a dime and like they go and do their own entrepreneur thing or whoever, like whatever. Whatever you end up doing, I can't tell people exactly what to do. But the process is always the same. It's the same for everyone, which is feel your feeling, pay attention to it, catch it, catch it sooner and then apply yourself to improve it sooner. Catch it sooner and apply yourself to improve it sooner. Yeah, that's the practical. Okay, that's great. I love it. That So this podcast are, is for really for people who want to go against the norms of everyone else. It's like they're rebels. We're rebels. We've always been rebels. And I mean, we have a Facebook group where we call everyone a rebel because this resonates. And most people want to stay in their unhappy thoughts and they want to stay in their unhappy feelings. And they want to say, this is how I am and my life sucks and this is how it is. But real rebels, people who like you who are following us and and subscribe to us and, and get this and feel what we're saying, those people the rebellious are going to do this because it's going to feel better. And I don't know about you, but it, if you found this video and you found our podcast is because you want to feel better. Uh, so you can make the choice to stay in your sad sadness and your hurt feelings and your anger feelings or whatever negative feelings that you're in or your thoughts. Or you can be a rebel and tell your thoughts and the world to F off and Start taking these steps. Start doing the practical things we're teaching in this video. Like, because I'll be honest with you, I really, really wish I had a video of who I used to be because all, all you can do is, is trust what I'm saying. But I was a really mean person. And I know that I tend to be super positive and cheerful and, and giggly on film, on camera. But so you, it's hard to imagine. But I was really hateful and I hated everyone and I was angry. But these things, the spinning the thoughts, the, the working on my feelings and changing my feelings, doing things to, to change those feelings, that's what changed my life. That's how I got happy. And if you, you deserve happiness. And again, if you found us, if you found this video, you want to be happy. So don't just watch more stuff. Apply it. And if you want to watch a whole video, then, then write in your notes the five things and then take steps right after it's done and do them all because you deserve to be happy. You deserve to be as happy as me. I'm super happy. So is he, he's ridiculously happy. <laughs> it's the next level and, and you, you deserve it. So please do it. Take the steps because we love you. So we're going to move on to the third life hack and that's your life choices moment to moment choices and i was a couch potato manifester <laughs> and if you don't know what that is uh maybe you've seen the secret or read the secret it is what taught me how to be a couch potato manifester and that's somebody who just sits on the couch and visualizes and thinks about what they want, but does absolutely nothing to get it. They're basically people who use the first two hacks only. They keep tweaking their thoughts and they keep improving their feelings, but they don't actually do anything. Oh, that's very true. They're so focused on the thoughts and the feelings because that's what the secret taught me. And that's what law of attraction taught me. And that's what spirituality taught me. And it's like, I know those are epic hacks. That's why I just went over them. I spent freaking forever talking about the nuances of thoughts and feelings. Mm -hmm. But a couch potato manifester is someone who's obsessed with those to the exclusion of all the other things. Okay, so that's true. That's very true. So then if changing our thoughts and changing our feelings make us happy, then how can life choices work with that and get us off the couch? Yeah, great question. Okay, how many hours in a day? 24. All right. And how many minutes in an hour? 60. Right. And how many seconds in a minute? 60. Right. So the amount of seconds in a day is 60 times 60 times 24, right? It's a... Yes. So if... Every second is a moment. We've got like 36,000 moments or something. Okay. Yeah. 
in a day. Yeah. And if every thought takes a moment, then we have 55,000 moments in a day. Yes. Because 55,000 thoughts on average. Right. So does every human being have the same 24 hours and the same 36,000 moments or 55,000 moments or whatever it is? Yeah. Right. So we all have the same number of moments in the day. And are we all blessed with free will to choose how we spend those moments? Yes. Right. Of course. Right. Some of us, like Nick Vujicic, the man with no limbs, might have to spend way more moments on hygiene and getting ready and getting out of bed and dressing himself and all this stuff. Right. Than you. Yes. But Beyonce might have to spend less time than anyone because she has a whole like team of people come in and dress her and do her makeup while she's talking on the phone or whatever. Right. Because she's Beyonce. Yeah. Right. But when she was a child, getting good at singing and so on, she didn't have that. No. So the point is, everyone has different circumstances, different environments, different life journeys, different conditions. Mm -hmm. But all of us have free will to spend our 55,000 moments or whatever thousand moments of the day. Yes. So each moment is a choice on how we spend it. You can choose to doom scroll and watch Netflix, or you can choose to go work out, or you can choose to go promote your business. Mm -hmm. You can choose to hustle. You can choose to get good at a skill. You can choose anything with your moments. True. Yeah. You can choose to go to work. You can choose to call in sick. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can choose to tell your boss to screw off. You can choose to be an entrepreneur, or you can choose to be a wage slave and just give in every, every day for the next 20 years. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Okay. So no matter who we are, no matter what our conditions, we are all given the same 24 hours, the same 55,000 moments, and we all get to make certain choices with those moments. Yes. Okay. Are there some choices that are much wiser and some choices that are much more foolish? <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. Right. And, and if I gave you an example of two people's lives, person A and person B, and I showed you all their life choices for how they spend their moments of the day, would you be able to tell which one are making wise choices and which one is making foolish choices? Yes. Probably. We can't really know for someone's life because they might be going through a phase and it might ultimately help them and so on and so forth. But for simplification's sake and for the lesson's sake, you could probably tell which one was making wise choices and which one was making foolish choices. Right. Yeah. Right. So if I show you person A stays in bed till noon, smokes weed for the next six hours, plays video games for the next eight hours, stays up late watching porn and then wakes up and does it again. And then I show you person B who wakes up, takes care of her kids, gets them off to school so she can free up her time to work on her business, then works on her business for as long as possible, then takes a quick break for self-care at lunch and has a power meal to get back to her business so she can get it off the ground and get making money and start helping community and helping society all in time to get back for pick up her kids later on. And then she comes home and at the end of the night, she has a small puff of weed and goes to sleep and does that all over again. You could tell me which one was making the wise choices and which one was making the foolish choices. Yes. Right. So they both had thousands of moments in the day and they both had the free will to change it at any time. The weed smoker could have started doing the entrepreneur thing at any time. Yeah. They could have taken self-care for lunch at any time. Mm -hmm. They could have closed the doom scrolling and turned off the porn at any time. Yes. Total free will to do this at any time. Mm -hmm. But they have a million excuses. They won't change their thoughts. They won't change their feelings. They won't do anything to feel better. They won't seek self-help. They won't do anything. And if you if you ask them how come they're not doing this, <laughs> they'll have a million excuses. Yes. Yeah. Okay. But the fact is, across the board, every human has the same number of moments and the same free will to do stuff with those moments. And if you want to go from this person to this person, it's going to take a lot of empowering choices along the way. You're not going to get there with bullshit choices. You're not going to get there just praying that like the big pharma boat comes along and saves you with medicine. It's not going to happen. This is not how you get your shit together. It's not how you get your life together. It's not how you make the journey. Yeah. You make sure. it with empowering choices, wise choices. Yes. Right. And all your heroes, if you read their biographies, they probably came from a pretty rough place. Mm -hmm. They Jim Carrey slept in his car. David Goggins was super obese. Oprah was abused and held down and racism and all kinds of stuff. But they started making empowering choices because they wanted to become person B. Mm -hmm. They knew moaning and whining and playing the victim is not going to cut it. They knew weed all day is not going to cut it. They knew delaying their dreams is not going to cut it. They knew putting up with the crappy boss is not going to cut it. They knew I have X number of moments in the day and I have X number of choices in the day. And it's super important that I start making empowering choices as soon as possible. And even if I can only make one empowering choice today, I need to make that one and then make two tomorrow. And I need to make three the next day. I really, really need to make this journey of choices. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And everyone else who's struggling and giant failure, if you look at their life, you'll see they refuse to make empowering choices. 
they will have literally countless excuses for why they don't make empowering choices. Yes. But everyone's free to, total free will. Anyone can make empowering choices at any time. It can start with one baby step or one baby choice, but you got to make them. Yeah. So if we go back to the couch potato manifestors, they learn a great life hack, a happiness hack. They learn to control their thoughts. And then they learn a second happiness hack. They learn to make sure they're feeling good and they're in a positive place with positive energy. But if they stay on their couch all day obsessing over these two life hacks, would you call that wise, empowering choices or foolish, disempowering choices? Foolish, disempowering choices. Right. Yeah. So they're they're like, I'm doing everything right. I'm really focused on these life hacks. I've got them down. My thoughts are good and my energy is good. And it's like, dude, one of your biggest superpowers is your life choices in the day. And you chose to sit on a couch obsessing over two life hacks. So, yeah, like... What's going to happen? Your life is going to be shit. Right. So what happens to all the couch potato manifestors? That's why they don't manifest. Yeah, exactly. You're going to ignore one of the most empowering things we have, free will and freedom of choice, and all the moments of of the day we can spend on empowering wise choices. They don't use them. What what do you expect? Yeah, but and the thing is, is that when you change your thoughts and you change your feelings and the universe will give you inspired actions or inspired ideas to to get you and, and they may not make sense to you. Oh, go get a slice of pizza. So why? I have food here. I don't know. But the universe inspired you to go walk down the street. Yeah, yeah, and you're gonna bump into a job offer or you're gonna bump into an opportunity or you're gonna see something in the window that catches your eye and helps lip- uplift your life or something. Like something. You need to start making yes. empowering life choices with your moments. And if your choices are like stay in my comfort zone, do the same old, same old, keep my same habits, obsess over my thoughts and feelings on the couch, m- visualize and pray like the secret and hope someone comes to save me or rescue me, you're screwed, man. These are not empowering choices. This is not what you were on the planet to do. Guarantee it. Ain't no one coming to save you. You have to save yourself. If you want to be happy, this is the third way to do it. Yeah. Listen to those inspired thoughts and those inspired feelings and take that inspired action. Yeah, do make it. wise choices. Yes. Take action. Yes, exactly. And, and it also goes along with what I said about my feelings or was it my thoughts, whatever, where I said I can call my kids or like watch a movie or listen to good music or something because the universe is inspiring me to do those things to feel better or, and to get closer to, to my goal. Yeah, this goes hand in hand hand with feeling better. Mm -hmm. When you get a feeling, an uncomfortable feeling, you have two choices. You can repress it and refuse to act on it, Mm -hmm. or you can pay attention to it and act to improve it. So everyone has this choice. We get a feeling many moments of the day, and we have the choice to improve that feeling every time. The wise choice is to improve it, to take some small step to improve your feelings just like the toddlers and the animals. The foolish choice is to repress those feelings, ignore those feelings, dismiss them, sit on them, and let them fester. Yeah. What choices are you going to make? That's good. That's good. And you know, I started in the intro, I started this episode saying I found those naked, <laughs> naked gurus. And they told me to get up at 5 a.m. and hustle and do the things. And I got up at 5 a.m. because like I thought, okay, I'll try this. And then I would go for a walk and with my dog and, and come back and sit down and, and then I would be like, now what? <laughs> yeah. So maybe you made one empowering choice to get up earlier. Yeah. And then you made some disempowering choices, right? Well, yeah. But that was a baby step choice. So that maybe was a- that was good. But even deeper than that is like those gurus are just focused on hack three. Mm-hmm. Make more empowering choices get up early yes but then if you're not doing hacks one and two again you're just you're just as screwed as the couch potato manifestors because they're obsessed with hacks one and two and refuse to do three make empowering choices yeah and then if you listen to these naked gurus who tell you to hustle you're obsessed with hack number three i'm hustling and i'm taking action and i'm making choices and these are empowering choices like okay but if your attitude is shit (laughs) and your thoughts are negative yes it's going to counteract everything. So what's the point? The, you have to use all three of these hacks well. You have to use them as a blend. You have to treat them like ingredients in a cake. You can't just use flour for the cake and you can't just use milk for the cake and you can't just use eggs for the cake. You have to use all of the ingredients for the cake. And don't give me some bullshit about these weird vegan recipes that just <laughs> use flour. The, you get the point. You get the lesson. Uh, yes. and anytime you show me someone who's obsessing over one of these hacks and ignoring the others, I'll show you someone who's in trouble. It's true. And those gurus, they were not giving me practical steps. Getting up at 5 a.m. is great. And then telling me to hustle is great. But if I 
couldn't control my thoughts. I couldn't control my feelings. I didn't understand what a what an inspired action was. I was doing things and super confused and super lost. And because I didn't know my purpose, I didn't know Jack. Uh, so until I met you, I wasn't able to get my shit together 100% because you taught me all these things. And you taught me the same exact thing that we're teaching them now. Uh, and if you think uh, this is great, this podcast, which is amazing, I know. You're welcome. <laughs> You'll love our book. It's called Eyes Wide Open Volume 1. And it is the world's first self-help coffee table book. And it has lots of juicy, amazing things in it. But we don't make any money from it. And then we really, really want you to have the information. So we're offering it to you for free in a PDF form. The link is in the description of this video. And I want to know what you think. Rise Rebels. I was calling y'all Rise Nation, but now we're going to call you Rise Rebels. Anyway, <laughs> Rise Rebels, tell me what you think about the PDF, the free book, in, in any of the video's descriptions or email me or whatever. I'd love to know your thoughts. And if you want to get Jay's juicy goodness for yourself and you want to talk to him about your specific situation and how maybe you want to talk to him about you have specific thoughts or specific feelings that you're not able to shift or you know, inspired action that you're not sure what to do after. Like if you want some actual help for that, I'm happy to set you up with a call with Jay. Just email me. So yeah. Yay. The fourth life hack is embracing change. Now I moved here to Canada to be near my mentor and my partner and the love of my life. And you would think that I would embrace the change and, and start moving towards being a better person. But instead, I started watching RuPaul's Drag Race all day and lying about what I was doing all day and not working and pulling away from the person, the reason why I moved here. <laughs> Most people would not do this. Why was it? Because I had a serious problem with embracing change. So Jay, can you please explain why embracing change matters more than making change? Yeah, it's a great question. This is a super amazing hack that most people ignore and I've never heard anyone else teach. But the main issue around this is that pretty much everyone has very little understanding all zero about change, but it's not their fault. We've all been trained this way. Navigating change is not something taught by society. It's not taught by parents or teachers or peers or corporations or the media or no anyone. No, no yeah. One. So it's okay to not know anything about change. Right. And if you want to learn about change, usually you have to do it in a long, hard journey. It's true. You need to like study and research in depth and practice heavily and so on to even know anything about change. So it's fine. And I'm going to do my best to solve all that right here. Okay. So first, let me ask you, does growth feel good? Yes. Have you ever met anyone who doesn't enjoy the feeling of growth? No. No, everyone does. Yeah. Again, all 8 billion humans enjoy the feeling of growth. Yes. And what about feeling stuck or stagnation or complacency? Uh, no, that feels terrible bad. Yeah. So that's the opposite of growth. Growth feels good to everyone and being stuck or stagnation feels bad to everyone. Yes. Okay. So what's another word for becoming unstuck or for growth? Starts with a C. Change. Exactly. Oh. <laughs> so this is the problem. This is the yes. issue. Most people fear change, but fearing change will keep you stuck. Yeah. yeah. And that's one of the worst feelings. It is. It will lead to unhappiness. Yeah. Can someone be happy if they are stuck? No. But can someone be happy if they are growing? Yes. Even if we fail, as long as we grow, how do you feel? Ah, oh, it feels so good. Right. It's like, I failed, but I learned so something. So good, yeah. I failed, but I got something out of it. Yes. I failed, but I'm growing. Yes. Right. And if you're making, taking steps to continue to grow, then it feels great. Exactly. So growth leads to happiness. Growth feels good. Growth is amazing. Growth is a number one ingredient in happiness. And stuck <sighs> is the number one ingredient in feeling depressed and unhappiness. And change is just a synonym for growth. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, technically, you can have change that's neutral or change that's worse. But, <laughs> but, yeah. but you can't have growth without change. So they go hand in hand. Yeah. And so they might not be an identical synonym. 
But for our intents and purposes, for our lesson here and for a journey towards happiness, you might as well think of them as same. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I totally agree. This is amazing. Yes. Right. So anyone out there who loves growth, which is all 8 billion humans, yes. must also love change. Right. Because uh, they're the same. Yeah. And it feels good. Yeah. It's they're so good. They go hand in hand. Yeah. They're basically the same. Yeah. Now, what happens when we love a topic in life? Someone who loves swimming will get a lot of what in their life? Swimming. Yes. Someone who loves crafting will get a lot of what in crafting. Their life? Someone who loves gaming will get a lot of gaming. Right. And what happens when we hate, fear, or avoid a topic? What do we get in our life? Oh, you get less of it. Right. If someone hates meeting people, what do they get? Uh, they get less of it and avoid it. Right. Yeah. If someone fears driving or plane flights, what do they end up with in their life? Nothing good because they're stuck at home. <laughs> they get no travel and they get no plane rides or car rides. Or right. If we love a topic and seek it out, we get more of it. If we fear a topic and avoid it, we get, we'll have a life experience with none of it. Yeah. You bent over backwards to avoid this. So right. great. Now you don't get plane flights or driving, but we're not, right? Right. Okay. So what about the topic of growth, which, which is also change? If you fear and avoid change, what will you have very little of? Change. And or growth. Yeah. If you fear or avoid change, you get no growth. Yeah. And that doesn't feel good. No, nope, That leads to unhappiness yes. and depression. You will feel stuck and stagnant. Yes. You cannot feel happy avoiding humanity's number one thing, growth. Yeah. Yeah. So if you fear and avoid change, you're f Oh my. Okay. Yeah. It's true. It's true. I spent so long, many, many years not growing and very miserable and unhappy. And I blamed my ex for that, but really it was me. It was because I didn't know any of these steps to, to make myself happy. And I definitely stayed away from change and, and growth. And did you want to change your marriage conditions? Yes. And, but did you? No. And it made me super unhappy. Right. You avoid change. You avoid growth. And then when you finally changed your marriage conditions. Oh, it was heaven. Yeah. It felt so much right. better. I was so happy. Right. Then someone, then someone else is in a miserable job and they want to change their job conditions, but they avoid change and they let it ride and they just keep staying in the job. They're miserable. They get stressed. Miserable. They get headaches. They get migraines. Yeah. Their their health gets worse. They get more and more miserable. Their mm -hmm. their marriage falls apart. It's like you should have just quit the job, dude. Yeah. Why y'all avoiding change? If you avoid change, you're fucked. Yeah. Even with the drugs, most people think, oh well, when you're ready to quit, you're just gonna quit. I avoided quitting because I knew. I was going to have to change everything about myself and my life. You'll have to change your friend circles, your peers. You'll have to change your habits. You have to change the times you wake up and where you go. You have to change the places you shop. You have to change the everything. Uh, place Every you live yes, in. Everything. Yeah. Yes. And that's exactly but, what happened. Well, whatever. I don't care. I don't care what you have to change. Yeah. You better love change. So what happens if we're kind of okay with change? What do we get in life? Kind of okay growth. Right. And is kind of okay growth fulfilling? No. It gives you like a small taste of it. But you want more and you cannot figure out why yeah. you're not getting more. But I made changes. Yeah. Are all 8 billion humans going to be fulfilled with kind of okay growth? No. 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 Right. Especially if you're on a video for how to be happy. You want some serious growth. Yeah. Yes. So you can't have an attitude of avoiding and fearing change. You can't even have an attitude of, well, I'm okay with change. Sort of, mostly, kind of. I'm okay with some changes. What do you need? What attitude do you really need? You need to embrace change yeah. and love it. Exactly. You need to be obsessed with change. You need to love all change, even negative change. I'm fine with it. It's all good. I don't judge change. I'm okay with any change. Life, bring on the change. I am ready for change. Please, because change is actually a synonym for growth. And I need it and I want it and I'm hungry for it. I can handle whatever comes. I'm going to adapt. I'm a creative human. I'm a powerful human. I got this. Whatever life brings, whatever changes come, I'm going to make the best of them and I'm going to grow. I'm going to grow and it's going to feel amazing. This is the attitude of someone who embraces change. This is the attitude of someone who understands that growth and change are hand in hand. This is the attitude of someone who knows if you ever, ever, ever have a, a slightly less than great attitude about change, you are shooting your life in the gut. You are headed for unhappiness fast. If you do not like change, good luck. So there was this stupid thing I used to tell myself. We had already met. Like when I was, when I was in New York and you were here. And there were like things that 
would crop up for me that I needed to change. And I would get mad and be like to myself, I would say, I quit smoking. I quit drugs. I'm losing weight. I'm not eating junk food. I- I've changed enough. <laughs> like, I've changed my life. Wow. I don't want to change anymore. But that was so bad that afterwards made me feel really bad about myself. Okay, I made those changes. Big deal. And I've, as you know, I've struggled with. I'm always, there's always going to be something to change. But it wasn't until I actually embraced change and I said, all right, I have to change everything. Like everything has to change. I just have to be a different person. Not for you, not for my kids, not for, but for me, because this feels really good. I'm finally happy and I want to continue to be more happy. And there are mega levels of happiness that I haven't even reached that I know are out there, but had to do this thing. So yeah, great. We've made changes. Maybe you've made some changes here and there. And you're like, feel the same. Like, I've made a bunch of changes. What else? There's everything. (laughs) It's everything. But embracing this was so helpful. It helped me to know that, okay, there's always going to be stuff I have to work on. And and it stopped me from feeling bad. Because I I felt bad about myself that, am I that shitty of a person that I have to change everything? Yeah, it has nothing to do with all this comparing and who's better and am I a bad person and do I need to change and yada, yada, yada. It just has to do with life. Yeah. Is there any ceiling on growth? No. Right. A tree can grow as high as it wants to grow. Yes. Yeah. A human can grow as as wealthy as they want to grow. Yes. You can grow in love and harmonious relationships as deep as you want to go. Yeah. Right. So there's always change available. There's always growth available. If everyone loves growth, why would the universe put a limit on growth. If you want to grow, grow. And if you feel in your heart you want to grow, then embrace change and keep growing. And it doesn't matter how many changes you've already made in the past. Oh, I've made thousands of changes. I'm the best and I don't need to grow anymore. It's like, whatever. There's no ceiling on growth. The only ceiling on growth is what you decide. Yeah. And if it feels like you should make another change or you want to grow or that your growth lies behind the next change, then go make it. Yeah. So I'm happy to tweak my systems or tweak my approach or practice or admit I'm wrong or make a mistake and have a failure and learn and grow and experiment anytime. I've been like that for years now and I'm happy to do it again tomorrow. I'm happy to do it right now on the podcast. So how can we we embrace this easier? It just takes practice like all the other hacks. So life will serve you up change all the time, whether you like it or not. That's true. You could say 4 billion people hate change and avoid it. And 4 billion people love change and embrace it. Both of them are getting served up a ton of change either way. True. But the ones who love it and embrace it will grow from the change. And the ones who avoid it will get minimal change served up to them, but still some. And when they do change, they'll just change to a neutral thing. Like, the same life, the same habits, the same partner over and over, the same shitty job, the same everything. And even if they do have one or two positive changes, their life will still remain stuck and they won't get the growth from it. Mm -hmm. And they'll feel like I'm not growing and my life isn't growing and I'm not blossoming and I'm not changing and nothing around me is changing and my wealth is the same and my bank account's the same and my partner is the same and my friends are the same and my house is the same and I deal with the same headaches and it's all the same stress and my health is the same and They'll feel the same, same, same. Yeah. But life will still be serving up change to both groups. Yeah. So those changes that life are serving up are like those automated tennis ball machines that keep serving tennis balls to people. And the people who fear and avoid change are like running from the ball or trying to dodge it or like, no, don't hurt me. <laughs> yeah. And the people who love and embrace change are like, bam, hitting it back, backhand, uh, lob, spike, whatever. And they're just getting good at the game of life and they're growing. They're becoming a stronger tennis player. Right. They're becoming a stronger player in life. And it will show. You'll you'll be like, wow, you're doing well for yourself. You've really thrived. You're strong. You're fit. You're healthy. Your business is growing. Your life is growing. How did you do it? They can't explain it to you. But the truth of how they did it is they embraced change. They improved their thoughts. They improved their feelings. They made wiser choices and they crushed life. They got good at it. They practiced and they didn't fear a single thing that life served up. Yeah, that's so good. It's true. 100% true. And there's a hidden secret about all of this that, again, no one teaches, which is there are three modes of change and we just covered them. The three modes are mental change, emotional change, and physical change, like actions and choices. And basically everybody has their comfort zone. They have one mode of change that they're comfortable with. So you go talk to an intellectual 
and they're super comfortable with intellectual change. They'll be open to new ideas. They'll do the research. They'll dive into topics and read the books and study. And they're do- it looks like they're doing so much work, so much intellectual work, but that's their comfort zone. It's where their habits are. Meanwhile, they feel like their boss isn't respecting them and their feelings are crunchy and they've been staring at the screen too long and their neck is sore. And there's a whole bunch of feeling issues that need addressed and need paid attention to. And the feeling mode of change is calling them, desperately calling them. But they're just like, well, I guess I have to read about neck pain now. I guess I'll just go intellectually read about neck pain. And they they go and try and solve their problem and navigate the change, the growth, again, with their intellect. It's like, dude, don't read about neck pain. Like, get away from the screen. Stop reading. Go (laughs) in nature and your, your neck pain will go away. Life is calling you to change with more of this mode, more of this area. And then you'll get the couch potato manifestors who are doing both of these and they refuse to make better choices in their life. And the change that's calling them is to change your habits, change your actions, go do something else, take steps, yes. speak differently, yeah. journal something, like go meet people, shake hands, hit on a girl, do something. And life is calling them to make change in this area. Yeah. It's like get out of your comfort zone mode of change and use the other modes of change to grow. This is where your growth lies. And the real change, the real secret is when you're using a healthy blend of each for whatever situation. So maybe you need a tiny bit of reading about neck pain and then go apply some self-massage techniques. It's like you read about the thing intellectually and then you made a choice to give yourself a neck massage and that choice led to a better feeling in your body and your heart and your emotions. It's like you used a correct blend to achieve the change, right. but most people don't. They get over-reliant or over-indulgent on one or two of the modes, and they don't use a, a healthy blend to change and grow and navigate life. If I get too intellectual when I need physical change, like maybe I need to work out or something and right. I'm not working out, or maybe I need to go for a walk and I'm not going for a walk, I'm all my intellect in the world is not going to help. Or maybe I'm focusing on visualizing and law of attracting and whatever, but really I need to make some choices. I need to quit that job. I need to divorce that person. I need to go have a hard conversation with my spouse. I I need to make some choices, but I'm not making choices and I'm doing everything I can to avoid making choices (laughs) because this is my comfort zone. You see what I'm saying? So this is how you practice embracing change. You pay attention to these modes of change and you start really applying yourself and practicing them and experimenting with them until you get the right blend for whichever situation you're dealing with. That's great. That's super helpful. And rise the rebels. <laughs> I want to know what you think. What do you think about these? These are three or four amazing life hacks. Let us know in the comments or send me an email. I really want to know your thoughts. Which one seems like hard for you or seems easy for you? I really would love to know. So hack number five is nuking your entire life. And this <laughs> is what feels like a hate crime because you feel like you hate yourself, you hate your spouse, you hate your kids, you hate your home, you hate everything. You hate just everyone and everything because you literally have to nuke your entire life to get to the level of happiness that you really truly want. And I have nuked my life not once, not twice, not three times, but many times. And while it can be painful, it's super, super necessary. So about four months ago, I broke up with Jay and asked him to leave because I was a dumbass. But the reason really isn't that important. The point is, the moment that the door closed between us and he said goodbye, I knew that I had made a mistake. So for the first two days he was gone, I wallowed in my sadness. I smoked a lot of weed. I stayed in my jammies and walked around, walked around the neighborhood in my pajamas. I was a miserable wreck. And then something interesting happened. I decided that this was bullshit. Not, not him, because I knew I made a mistake and I really loved him and wanted him back. But I needed to change my life. Like the whole thing needed to, be, like I needed to fix something. I started eating healthier. I started counting calories. I started losing weight. I started working out. I started working on the business. We had broken up and that meant the podcast was over, but I felt miserable and unhappy. And I sat right here in this spot and and said, how can I be happier? What can I do? And I said, I'm going to work. Like, I don't care. I'm working. I don't care what he says. I'm working. (laughs) And I started working. 
and I instantly felt better. And every time I worked out, I felt better. And every time I ate health, something healthy, I made a healthy choice, I felt better. The point is, I had to destroy my entire relationship and my life uh, and my actual living space <laughs> to feel better. Like I made massive changes. And then I called you and the first phone call didn't <laughs> go so great. I was really, uh, I was super emotional and I wasn't able to really express what I wanted to express. And we began talking and, and you noticed that I was making changes. So you were more open to coming back, right? Mm -hmm. And now we're back together and we're still working on things. And But the, the point is, I had to destroy my entire life to realize what I wanted and what I needed and to make massive, massive changes. And I have not looked back since then. And this is not the first time. I did it with my ex-husband. I did it with the drugs. I did it with lots of times. And each time I had to, I nuked my life, I got better. I changed. I grew. I got happy. And so this is why a lot of people struggle with change because they're not willing to do that. So Jay, why is nuking your life so super important to change? Do they really have to really nuke it all? Okay, so nuking your life, blowing everything up is kind of like energy drinks, okay? Okay. It's a shortcut to what you want. It's a shortcut to massive growth and a quantum leap towards true happiness. And a lot of people go this path. It's not for everyone, but a lot of people do it. You can read countless stories or hear countless interviews where someone hit rock bottom and revolutionized their life from there. Right. When I was homeless and jailed and robbed and suicidal and begging to die on a bench, I hit rock bottom. I, my life was clearly nuked and that was a turning point for me. That's when things turned around and I met Evan and started helping him grow a celebrity brand and everything changed. You did the same thing with the recent breakup and you did it before with overdosing on heroin. Mm -hmm. And so nuking your life is kind of like an extreme version of the last hack, embracing change. Someone who nukes their life, blows everything up, is demonstrating to the universe, I am okay with massive change. And when you say I am okay with massive change, you also get quantum leaps and yes. huge growth. Yeah. Even when I was a child, when I quit my job and dumped my girlfriend in the same day, it created massive growth and I felt much happier. Right. That said, it's not always the most pleasant path and there are side effects. Just like with energy drinks, it's not for everyone. <laughs> yeah. Energy drinks are for people who are looking for a quick shortcut. Mm -hmm. Side effects be damned. Yeah, that's true. Same with blowing up huge chunks of your life. And it's a degree. You don't have to blow up everything. But as long as you're blowing up a significant chunk of your life, you're going to get this. You're going to get this effect. Right. So does that explain its relevance to growth and happiness? Yes. Yeah. I okay. Gotcha. So any other questions? Well, so I want to add that because you didn't like come back right away or anything. We were gone for like a month. And when you were gone, I felt and I didn't know that you were going to come back or anything. And I thought to myself, I did this and I'm OK with what happens. I'm OK if we are just friends or we just are working on the podcast. I was OK with what I did. I would. Yes, I took responsibility for what I did. And I knew that it was the best thing that I could do in that moment. Like, cause I was being, I was super negative and being a shitty place and just not doing this, these steps to be happy. I stopped all of them and taking responsibility and just saying, okay, universe, what, whatever happens, happens regardless. And I accept it. And this too seemed to like move the needle for me. Sure. Like I said before, in our personal responsibility episode, our blame the family episode, if you take responsibility for something, you automatically gain control over it. Yes. And your yeah. life feels less out of control. Yes. Yeah. So even though nuking your life isn't the most recommended, but kind of it is, because as long as you're willing to take responsibility for it, I think, right? Yeah. It's an advanced technique. Right. For people who are bold and brave and ready for it. Right. So can you still be happy if you do the other things that step one through four and kind of leave five off and not nuke your whole life? Yeah, technically. Sure. Okay. Just like you can succeed at sporting events without energy drinks or you can pull all nighters without energy drinks. Right. But is that the way you want to go? It might make it easier. It might make it faster. You might get faster results 
if you apply this hack, right? This is the advanced ninja, bold, crazy quantum leap act that gives you massive growth and puts you on your path towards happiness quickly. And lots of people choose it. They hit rock bottom and that's the turning point and they become famous celebrities and they rock life or whatever. They meet their spouse or... This is like the epitome of, of rebellion. Like this is what like really what rebels do is to nuke the life that they have so they ha so they can get better because I would not have ever been able to reach the level of betterment for myself had I not done it along the way each single time. Other Otherwise, I'd still be a drug addict or be dead from it. You know, so do you think that if people do steps one through four, that eventually they'll want to, to get to a point where they want to nuke their life and blow everything up? That's a really good question. And I haven't thought that through enough, but it, it wouldn't surprise me if that's the case. It's sort of a logical extension of the other four hacks, yeah. but it's something you really have to be ready for. Because most people hate doing this. Most people will do anything they can to avoid letting go of old identities. They don't want to let go of anything they are. So so have you invested a lot into becoming who you are today? Y yes. You, you would say you've invested a lot in becoming who yes. you are today. I think this goes for most people. They feel inside, I've invested a lot in yes. becoming who I am today. Right. And do you know anyone who willfully and eagerly and gleefully will let go of something they've invested heavily in? Mm. No. Okay. No. So if people have invested heavily in their identities and who they are today, I make this much money and I do this and I am this and I have this friends and I have this peer group and I have this kind of house and this kind of living environment and I'm a fan of these sports teams and I spend my hobbies and time doing this and this. Are they going to let go of any of that very easily? No. no. Okay. So then I want you to imagine that life is a ladder and everyone is clinging on white knuckled for dear life to their current level, their current identity, the current rung on the ladder. This is who I am, they say. Right. This is what they think. Mm -hmm. And they will kick you if you try to pry their hands <laughs> off this. If yeah. you try to help in any way. Right. You want to help them let go of a certain thing, reach for something greater. They will fight tooth and nail until their hands are bleeding. And you can see, like, you're hurting, dude. Please just let go of the ladder. They won't. But to reach greatness, to get growth, to grow higher in life, to reach happiness, what do we have to do to reach higher? Oh, you have to let go. So ah, so you have to let go of your identity. When I was down and out during the dark homeless years, I was clinging, like, I'm a productive person and I will get out of this and I'm an entrepreneur and I'm going to solve this and I'm a genius and I have a high IQ and all these labels that have been put on me. And you know when things turned around? You let go. Yeah. And I was like, fuck it. I'm a giant failure. I'll be a failure till the end of time, I guess. It's my new identity. My new identity is failure and I'm at peace with it and it actually feels good and I feel free and I don't have to do anything and I don't have to try to get out of this and I don't have to work hard and I don't have to do anything and I can just be homeless forever until like two weeks pass and I die of starvation or something. It was the most freeing thing I'd ever done. I just let go of all of the shit yeah. and that's what let me reach for higher things and follow the flow and follow my impulses and start to feel better and start to reach more happiness. You can have a better life when you're willing to let go of the one you're clinging to. Right. But it's very difficult to find a human being who will consciously do this. They will fight you tooth and nail. Yeah. And for a coach or a motivator or anyone like that, a teacher who wants to help these people, it's like trying to save a drowning victim. Like they won't help you. They will make your job hell. Yeah. And so if you nuke your life, it's kind of like just leaping up five rungs or something. <laughs> yes. But yes. You, for that minute in free fall, that minute when you let go, it's like the scariest feeling yes. in the world. Like I'm going to die or whatever. It really feels like hell on earth. Like I'm killing my old identity. It does. Yeah. I'm killing my identity as a mom. I'm killing my identity as a swimmer. I'm killing my identity as a gamer. I'm killing my identity as a dauber or a nine to fiver. I'm killing my identity as a successful person. I'm killing my identity as an er. I guess I'm not an er anymore. Like it well, feels terrible. That's why I said it feels like a hate crime. It feels like you hate yourself. Like you're you're destroying your whole life. And and But you should. You yeah, hate, you have to. You hate the old version of you that is no longer serving you. Yeah. You hate the average earner. You hate the, I'm just a mom. Like, no, you're more than that. And you can be more than that. And you're going to be more than that. If you just let go for a second, 
And it doesn't mean you can't be a mom later or be an earner later or be a nine to fiver later. You can always pick it back up. Life hasn't ended, but people act like it will. Yeah. And so this is why nuking your life is so difficult for so many people. Yeah. And yeah. it's why it's an advanced technique that I recommend after you've got a hang of the other four hacks. But I did it in reverse order. Like I nuked my life first and then learned all the other hacks. This is a very painful route. Yeah. Agreed. But it taught me a lot and it made me Same. good at this. Same. It was trial by fire. I would have preferred a better way. I, why are you crying this whole speech, man? I'm just trying to teach this thing. Um, and just because because if I had not in, took in responsibility and if I hadn't done it, then things would have ended between us in a different way and we would never have come back to each other. Yeah, true. Because eventually the pace and direction would have taken us apart. Absolutely. If you clung to your old life, yes. I would keep going forward in my life and keep making changes and embracing growth. Yeah. And you'd be like, I'm never growing and I'm going to be my same me and he's a stupid idiot and I'm not going to listen, like yeah. whatever. Yeah. It, it won't create the harmony and the happiness you were looking for. So I'm glad you chose better. Me too. <laughs> and so I'm very emotional about it because because I know that it sounds really freaking scary and it sounds like I have to like change everything and that's overwhelming if you're ready but if you have practiced steps one through four you will be ready you will be ready and that's changing your friend group and changing maybe changing your spouse it doesn't have to be but it's changing things it's changing family ties it's it's changing so many things like you said that our identity that we hold near and dear to us and it is scary for that moment to let go because we think we're gonna fall and die but actually what's gonna happen is we're going to let go and grab the next one and 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 then the next one and you go fast because this is like you said an advanced an advanced technique and it's it's life changing yes it's scary but it's good scary it really is yeah and the other four basics are more than enough in rock climbing when you let go like that it's called a dyno it's like a dynamic jump a dynamic oh, okay. movement where you let go of the wall and and it's advanced no one goes into their first class and does dinos i mean it's super no. ridiculous yeah you learn the basics first you learn how to climb you learn how to fall you learn how to traverse whatever and when you're ready and you feel up to it, you give dinos a shot. So, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, this is great. Well, I wanted to make sure that we included this one because for those who may be more advanced and they're, they've got number ones through three and they're working on four, to know that there is more past embracing change. Yeah, you can quantum leap your life. Man. Yeah, you really can. And uh, I highly recommend it when you're ready. If this sounds scary as F to you and you're terrified, you're not ready. And that's okay. Because when I was ready, I woke up that morning and I looked at you and I was like, I don't even want to say the words because it, it like bothers me. But I woke up and, and ended things. There was no fight. There was no argument. There was nothing. It was just like, I was ready and I did it. And I said, great. Yeah. And it was actually one of the greatest breakups I've ever had in my life. You were insulted that I was so cool with it. <laughs> it's offensive. But it. It went really well. It was super smooth and we had the day together and stuff before you left and we talked out a lot of things and, and there was still no fighting. Well, because because we were ready for this. So anyway, thank you so much. We spent a lot of time on this. We You have a lot of editing to do now because of it, <laughs> but I love you. And this is super helpful because before we met and I was typing in how to be happy in, into YouTube, I would have done anything for a video like this. I would have done anything for some of this advice to know that someone else, else was out there searching the same thing because the only things that came up were uh, personal development videos, but nobody was breaking it down like this for me. Yeah, this is all. literal gold. This is yes. like 30 years of hard won lessons yes. through the worst hell on earth years yes. from a natural born teacher or explainer. And I know this is pure gold, diamonds, galaxy brain shit. And, and I'm, I don't even feel bad bragging about it. Like you shouldn't, I, I would challenge anyone to find a, a more helpful, more clear, more on point, more valuable, more high leverage, more life changing video on happiness than this. I'd love to watch it. I really would. I'd love to be proven wrong. I hope someone puts it in the comments, but I honestly don't think it's going to happen. I agree. I totally agree. I searched long and hard on YouTube 
for someone to give me something. And all I got was wake up at 5 a.m. and hustle. If people apply, really apply and practice the hacks listed here, Life 180 revolutionized life, completely changed, on their way to true happiness, no problem. And those skills never leave you. They're permanent. How do you give someone more than that? Right. So Rise Rebels, I want to know, are you ready to nuke your life? Are you not? Are you terrified? Are you intrigued? Share with us, please, in the comments, or you can always email me and talk to me privately. I appreciate you so very much. So I just have one last question. Do you have any final thoughts that you'd like to share with our wonderful audience? Yes. Every human being has been born with untouchable, inalienable superpowers that can lead them to happiness. And you've just learned about three of them today. Our thoughts, our moods, and our choices. They are the three modes of change. And if you embrace change and use those modes well in a healthy blend, you can absolutely transform your life and be happy the vast majority of the time. But you have a choice. You can stay in your comfort zone, relying on a single change mode that you're comfortable with and fearing and avoiding change to a certain degree. Or you can leave your comfort zone, practice all the other modes of change, practice embracing change and loving change, and even go so far as to nuke your life if that feels appropriate. All it takes is some committed practice. Like decide in your heart and soul you're going to get this. You're going to get the hang of this. And you're going to master this and nothing's going to stop you and you'll have no excuses. Then happiness will be yours. The choice is yours. I know what I'm choosing and I hope you'll join me. Together we rise. And that's why this podcast and our book are called Eyes Wide Open. And if you are anxious to talk to your therapist about these five life hacks, then you might like this video here where Jay teaches you the five things that your therapist might be lying to you about about your anxiety. Keep rising.